When I was in my teens, my uncle Aimé bought himself a house for $10,000, which was very cheap even back then. It'd be incredibly cheap now. And it was in the middle of north central Illinois, near a town t called Tonica. And it was on a street that terminated in this state park that had some canyons and there was an old abandoned brick factory nearby. And basically he just lived in one of these houses along this street. And it was, you know, basically a county road. He had a Tonica um, post office box, so he'd have to go in every once in a while. I don't think there was actually mail service to a lot of these houses along the street. And the first time that I came to visit him, it was in February. Um, I was 18 years old. I was getting ready to go into the army. So this would have been, you know, 1989 or so. And then uh, I visited him again in, uh, it would have been 1994 after I finished college. And uh, it was me and, and my girlfriend at the time uh, dropping in to stay for a little while. And then the other time that I stayed to visit was after my first year of graduate school. So we would be talking about the summer of 1996, and I stayed for about a week or so. And the first time that I came to visit, I'm not exactly sure how the logistics worked out, but he must have been up uh, near us in Wisconsin and invited me to come down and stay for a while. And I think I stayed for maybe five or six days and it was incredibly cold. You know, the winds blow out of, you know, Canada across the Great Plains and into uh, Illinois, which is largely at that point that point pretty you know flat in in many respects so th there's not an awful lot of uh, forest so it, it can get pretty rough in the winter there was snow everywhere it was colder down there than it was up by us in wisconsin you know several hours drive north and so we'd stay in his house you know and he had heat uh we stayed out of the uh, screened in porch because it was super, super cold there. He didn't heat that part of it. It was a small house. He had lots of books and uh, not a hell of a lot else other than his, you know, carving tools and stuff like that. But Aim was a social guy. And so, you know, the day after we got down there and I remember him giving me what we call a pile cap. It's one of those, those caps it was actually his from the air force that has like ear flaps that you can you can button up and um you know we uh in the morning got up and we walked down the road and we went to a place that was called the store right and it was a general store and it just so happened that my cousin ben ames first cousin my second cousin had purchased this a while back and was making a go of it. And he, uh, the, the store was not just a general store where you could buy groceries and stuff like that. It was also a restaurant and it was kind of like the, you know, the, the place that everybody went to, not just in the morning, but through the rest of the day to meet everybody else and talk about stuff and have some coffee and warm up. It was heated by a uh, iron, uh, you know, pot belly stove that you'd feed wood into. There are a lot of wood burning stoves down there. And it was so, so cold, right? And we'd come in, Aim actually had a full beard and there'd be like icicles in his beard from condensation, right? And so we go in and we're, we're you know, ha having breakfast in the morning, some coffee and eggs and stuff like that. And, you know, catching up with my cousin Ben and some of the kids going in and out and chit-chatting and stuff like that. And then there were the, the locals, right? And we would, we would talk with them and some of them would tell tall tales. Like one of them was an older guy who told this clearly false story about, you know, growing up on the Mississippi River and some kid getting dragged down by an alligator gar that was 18 feet long and they, you know, 
set off depth charges in the river and up came, you know, an alligator gar that had bits of this kid inside. Probably not any, any truth to that story. But a lot of people would, would sit around and tell stories or they would play cards and, you know, uh, have some more coffee and stuff like that. And then, you know, we'd go back to, to the place and he introduced me to some of his other neighbors. Everyone was very friendly out there. Um, one of the neighbors I remember, not on that trip, but on a later trip, kept raccoons, uh, kind of a dangerous thing to do, kept uh, essentially feral raccoons cooped up in a giant cage and they were trying to domesticate them and that never really worked all that well. And one of the girls actually got, got scratched by one of them and then they got rid of those. But uh, some of the other things that were really cool about being out there was, you know, as I mentioned, there were these canyons, there was a state park I think it was either a state park or county park. And, and it, you know, you'd, you'd walk down the street all the way to the end. And then there were some stairs that you could go down. And then you were in this massive, cool area. There was like a creek flowing through it. That's how the canyons had been eroded over time. And so we would, you know, take hikes through those areas. And, you know, we'd, we'd, walk around other places as well. And one of the things I remember about that time was just, you know, always being cold in one way or another. You, you, you might be like close to frostbite or, you know, you might be warming up by the stove, but your back was getting cold or you'd be snuggled under a bunch of blankets and you could see the, you know, your air uh, coming out of your mouth, your breath, you know, condensing and looking almost like smoke. And then of course, both, uh, everyone was smoking back then as well, smoking cigarettes. And, um, we had a good time, you know, there were some parties during that time as well. And, uh, Ben had a party room at the time that we all gathered in and shot pool and drank beers and smoked cigarettes and listened to music and told stories and, all of that sort of stuff as well. And I had a good time for those, you know, four or five, maybe six days before I was supposed to go back up to Milwaukee and report for induction in the, the U.S. Army. And it was, it was a nice time. I'd quit my job. I was no longer going to the, the dojo to practice. I had a lot of time on my hands. And one of the cool things about, like, hanging out with AIM and living out there on the, you know, the plains in Illinois with him for a while was you could constantly hear the wind and there was plenty of silence as well. Nobody felt like they had to chatter and talk all the time. And, you know, you could read a book if you wanted to, you could whittle, you could do other things as well. And so that was, that was, you know, quite refreshing. I mean, it was really Spartan circumstances, but I was already kind of used to that anyway. I've, you know, at that time in my life, I'd lived, you know, fairly, uh, uh, let's say frugally, not necessarily poor, but I didn't have an awful lot of stuff. And so it didn't bother me at all. And it was nice just to like hang out and enjoy the, uh, the cold and the, uh, dark and the, you know, the quiet of snow and the constant, you know, whoo of wind as well. So that was, that was one time there. And then, you know, the second time that I stayed, as I mentioned, I had a girlfriend of sorts, I should say. She was actually a German exchange student who I kind of treated as a girlfriend, but she was actually cheating on her fiance with me. <laughs> so, you know, it wasn't all that surprising when later on she, she cheated uh, on me with, with some other people. But um, after school ended, after college ended, we took my car and we drove around to different places. And, you know, I, I thought, well, we'll make a cheap trip out of this. We'll stay with some of my family members, my relatives. So we drove down to, you know, stay with Uncle Aim. And we, that time we actually did stay out on the, the porch because it was you know, pretty warm and it was uh, quite nice, you know, when the breeze was flowing. And we only stayed a couple days. Um, we explored the canyons again, did some hiking, which, you know, I love to do, Aim loved to do, this, this girl Andrea liked to do as well. And uh, we explored the old brick factory, uh, which was quite extensive, you know. 
Uh, there were these gigantic kilns where they had them, the, the massive piles of bricks, some of them stacked up neatly, some of them just like all over the place. And it was uh, pretty cool to, to check out, you know. Uh, so that, you know, that didn't last all that long. We did some more partying, of course. I mean, I was at that time 24. Andrea was about 28. And uh, so, you know, back to Ben's party room. And actually by that time, they had um, one of uh, Ben's kids was living in a trailer. And we hung out there and, you know, partied as well, got real drunk and, uh, uh, had had a good time shooting you know we also shot pool and they they had an actual pool that we could swim in so that that was you know kind of a a fun time and then the last time uh aim you know he knew that i was in the dorms at southern illinois university in carbondale and he'd been down to carbondale a couple times because i had a few of my cousins living down there pat and mish uh, there was another cousin, Th those were in, in his generation and they had two daughters. And then there was another cousin, um, I want to say a May who was, uh, studying like, you know, uh, something mechanical down there as well. So he knew the area he'd been down in that region. And so he knew that I had to get out of the dorm and I had some stuff and then I was going to be moving into this trailer park. So he was like, well, you know, why don't I come down and I'll bring my truck and we'll just grab all your stuff, throw it in the back of the truck and you can come out and hang with me. And then when you can move back into the trailer, I'll drive you back down there and uh, we'll move you in. And that, that's in fact what we did. So I stayed there about a week. By that time, one of my cousins was working as a cook in, in one of the nearby restaurants. So we, we spent a lot of time getting food from that restaurant. And of course there was more partying and more hiking and more traveling around and enjoying ourselves. It was kind of funny that, that Aim was not a big cook himself. He preferred to get lunch meats and make sandwiches for himself. And, um, you know, he could boil water for coffee, but that, that was basically about it, you know, as far as his cooking went. As a matter of fact, I found when th that time I came in, his stove wasn't hooked up. Uh, somebody had unhooked it at some time and he just never bothered to hook it back up. So I, I hooked it back up and we got some groceries and I made some meals and that was, that was kind of nice. And I, I would, you know, read through the books that uh, Aim had if I hadn't read them already. So he was into a Stephen King phase at the time. And I remember reading the Tommy knockers and a few other books as well. Uh, and just, you know, hanging out and again, uh, enjoying time with my, my family, my mom's side of the family, the Lemrises and enjoying that, uh, wonderful natural environment, um, that, you know, it's not completely natural. There's roads, there's houses, obviously, but there's an awful lot of nature, big skies, lots of interesting weather and uh, creatures all over the place, birds, animals of, of different sorts. Bugs sometimes would be a problem, but not too big of an issue. And so I have some really fond memories of these times that I spent hanging out essentially at my uncle Aimee's place. And, you know, aside from the one time that Andrea and I drove down, it was always Aim coming to pick me up and drop me off. He was a very generous guy. He, uh, worked at, you know, at, at a, um, uh, engine shop, you know, basically cleaning up. He took me there to see the engine shop as well and meet the guys that he worked with. And, um, you know, he would do odd jobs here and there for other things because he was pretty handy. And there, there was a vast network of, of family members living out there as well, mostly coming from one other branch of our big Lemrees family. So, you know, for me, this is something that I've been thinking about lately. Um, it's been a while since he died, uh, about two years and I miss him a lot, you know. Um, I didn't get to see him as much as I would have liked to the last, you know, eight, nine, maybe ten years of his life. 
Um, but he, he was somebody who made a big impact on me in my childhood and my teens and my 20s. And part of it was by opening up his little home to, to me, to, you know, kind of goofy, crazy teenage and 20-something metalhead Greg who uh, loved to party and uh, smoked like a chimney and read a lot of books and, you know, had a lot of opinions on, on things. And AIM was, was cool with that. He was the, the fun uncle. And um, that's probably where I'll end this story. I, I didn't really have a vast, you know, point to this, but I thought I would share that with you. Um, this guy, my great, my uncle, M.A., and uh, the times that I stayed with him down there in Illinois.